one of the reasons I wrote this book was that I had, was starting to feel like this act of storytelling in our time has become so urgent. Um, and that my prior work, I had almost felt as if I were writing like a chess player with the book far away. And what I wanted to do was write a book that would really intimately engage the reader at every step um, and sort of turn, turn it inside out. Um, I began writing it at the beginning of the pandemic when all of us didn't know what was going on. And I was using the sort of chapter headings of Roland Barthes, A Lover's Discourse. I was teaching it in one of those first pixel, you know, Zoom pixelated classes that people began to have. And we, I can say more, but so one of the things that I've found that I really want to do with this, is this, am I going in and out with the mic? But it's okay. I like to have it be a kind of different sort of event um, than the standard book reading. I like taking advantage of our brief provisional community. So I think the way it will work tonight is Carolyn and I will have a little conversation, maybe very short reading. And then there's an excerpt from the book for you to look at. And we're going to do a tiny little kind of group conversation. <laughs> um, and then, you know, maybe we'll have a kind of collective harvest and Q&A at the end. So it's just a way of kind of, invo you know, creating this community and intimacy that I'm looking to create with this particular book. Okay, anyway, so Carolyn has been, she's one of my favorite readers of literature as well as this amazing writer. Um, whatever you want to start with, I'm prepared to read the beginning. Mm -hmm. And also I like to ask the audience to choose any page number between one and 311, and I will read that page as well. But anyway, <laughs> go ahead. Great. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. And Deborah, thank you for that song. It reminds me of um, uh, the line about uh, your uh, new love and watching uh, watching him and a group of musicians improvise within parameters, which I feel is so much what this book is about. And I was feeling um, the pressure of improvisation while thinking about this conversation and feeling great gratitude to Liz Rossner for keeping this perfect beat. And I hope you were right because I was just following <laughs> you and feeling sort of that excitement of being asked to participate in something unexpectedly. And I think for me, this reading this book, which um, I told Edie I just got the other day finally, and I've spent the entire day reading it and I'm drunk with it. I mean, I'm just so in the experience of the intimacy of this book, which is a, a, a lover's discourse not addressed to the lover, of course. It's addressed to you, the reader, to me, the reader. So I'm in a kind of um, state of jouissance <laughs> I, have to, I just have to <laughs> apologize also to all of you. Part of, I had neurological Lyme last summer, and one of the things it seems to have affected my brain is coming back, but my half my face was frozen. Um, is that when I when I'm moved by things, I seem to have lost the regulatory ability to not cry. So I am just. There may be moments when I am moved that I cry. So I'm just doing it as a little announcement, just in case. Anyway, thank you. Okay, carry on. So just to say, I'm, I'm so excited to be here and for this conversation. And I think it might be best for you to just start with the reading, if that's what you'd like okay, to do. Sure. So I'm just going to read the opening. Um, and I think that you may... Is that true, Evan? Do you have little printouts of this? Yay, look at this. Yeah, actually, let's send on that. Because we're going to use this later in our conversation. But right now, I'm just going to read aloud from this. So you can kind of follow along. Um, it's from the very opening of the book. Um, so there's an image. So the book is, it's both blocks of text. And then sometimes there's a lot of use of the white space. I'm not going to say it's poetry. But... Um, so the first image is this kind of lonely plinth. And I'm just going to read this first part. Do you have a, it, does it say to be engulfed? OK, good, OK. To be engulfed. You, of course, tell your story.
from wherever you find yourself and hope someone might hear. Imagine the laws of life, a mother birthing a tiny creature on an eastern coast, critter no larger than letter T in time, a life form seek, seeking not just survival, but thriving. Imagine a little bug bit me, lower left cranium, survival center. And ignoring protocol because of the year of our shutdown, I impatiently pulled it off. Or imagine a game of shoots and ladders in the thick resounding of an echo chamber. Your mother has died. You are now mother root for three daughters. You have been party to a divorce. You have moved several times then slide into unprecedented global pandemic, which is not the story I will try to tell. Let us call it, however, the ripcord. First shock when all of us tugged a parachute, the survival wish, and then the float, in which we now quite live forever, prior rules of time, space, and communion suspended. Now the ripcord, lost, a twirl in memory. The float remains. You have been in, alone in isolation with your daughters for a year. Let's say you also wish to believe in, if not wholly invent, some new language of love. Thrill, calm, belong, discover. One narcissist friendly definition. You love the version of yourself held in the gaze of the beloved. Or, a sense of security over time. Or you love who and what you become in the light of the beloved. Or you have come together to savor and learn, and in safety you heal each other's wounds and then continue to discover more. OK, thank you. So we're going to use that later in our conversation, but yes. So that's the beginning of this work, which at moments is called a novel by you or by others. Um, it's, it's a novel in some ways, and in some ways it's, um, it, there, there's a narrator and there's an author who are both present. And I wondered if, um, well, maybe first just to ask, are there, are there Bart fans in the audience? Are there people who um, are obsessed with the work of Roland Bart um, or who were influenced by Roland Bart? Not particularly. Edie. <laughs> well, so I think that's that's interesting. Edie's had a long relationship with um, the the semiotics and philosophy of Roland Barthes, and and actually, I have not. You haven't. No, this is a novel. <laughs> it really that I know. I mean, I'm not. Oh, oh, I'm not making, it's, you, know, you I, haven't. I'm, it's, in, in other words, you're totally right that this is obsessed with Bart. Um you know, uh, I can talk about, I can share my relation to Bart, but, but it's, or that's, I, I didn't mean, I didn't that's mean, a conceit I, of the book. Is that's that you've a conceit had a long, of the book. Oh, great. Yes. Great. Okay. I, I, I did the exact wrong thing for improv. I should have said yes. And not. <laughs> well, I think that's, I think that's a great place to start. So okay. it sounds like people haven't necessarily been deeply influenced by Bart. So Maybe you could speak a little bit about the role of Bart in, in inspiring the work. And then I'd love to talk a little bit about readerly and writerly works, because I think that's, that's really important and central to me. That's great. Yeah, okay. thank you. Um, yeah, I really didn't mean to cut you off. But no, you no. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, so Roland Bart was a semi-closeted gay man in the 60s and 70s, um, literary theorist really playful. When I was an undergrad, he did kind of, he was one of many who kind of dominated, you know, the world of how we learned um, in my, in my particular school. It was, um, I sort of resisted him because he was so present. And then it was only later that I found this book, Mythologies. And that, that is a book that influenced mm -hmm. me. So mm -hmm. you are right. Um, in that way, I think I resisted him. 
it's this incredible short book where he goes on and on about, let's say, the metaphysics in the planes of Greta Garbo's face. Or, yeah, or, you know, or, or he'll say things like, um, the professionalism of the striptease artist keeps her cloaked. He's very playful. So his kind of form of cultural criticism, you are right. It did influence me. And um, so I resisted him as long as I could. And then I sort of, but he, he kind of created something that I think I carried forth in my other novels, which it was to try to have this cloaked cultural criticism in my work. Um, but so it was the dawn of the pandemic. I started teaching um, this particular book, A Lover's Discourse, and I just felt he was speaking to my heart. I felt I had never known about love until more recently. And something about this book of this semi-closeted gay man spoke to me. And then I kind of took the deep dive into knowing more about him. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I would describe the book. Re Rebecca Solnit recently uh, described her her work as meandering narratives um, that sort of connect up and detach and braid again. And um, uh, you know, one of her recent books is about her mother developing Alzheimer's and uh, a bunch of apricots moldering on a tablecloth and other things. And this book uh, brings together. Um, you know, the, this kind of thoughtful consideration of Bart in the context of a new love affair and in the context of an intimacy with the reader and in the context of a whole childhood spent um, uh, uh, avoiding intimacy or performing to avoid intimacy and a kind of a reflection on how that um, affects a person's ability to love later in life. Um, and a person's ability to suddenly fall in love with someone younger and sexy and to feel, as, as you just read, kind of seen anew in someone's eyes. So um, the, the Bart isn't uh, the only uh, aspect of the novel or the, the, the novel. Um, and I think um, it's, it's a real departure for Edie, who to me has always been a novelist of big ideas. And uh, you talk in, in the book the narrator talks in the book about uh, writing like a man because she's learned to see like a man. And I feel like this is a very feminine book in a lot of ways, um, in the way that Bart, the closeted gay man, is free to um, think of the erotics of love, the erotics of language, and to meander in, I think, a less linear, less uh, you know, climax-seeking way. And um, so I wondered how it felt to write this book, what you feared in writing the book, and um, yeah, what was your biggest fear and what gave you the confidence um, and humility to write a book like this? That's such a good question. <laughs> um, you know, I sort of feel, we probably all felt this, right, with the pandemic, that what did we have to lose? You know, it's like, you might as well tell the truth. We're, we're on the brink of apocalypse. And I think with this book, I just felt, you know, suddenly the pandemic broke and I was suddenly supporting seven to 10 people within this rambly house, seven to 10 beings and animals too. And I just... Um, I felt it's now or never just kind of put yourself out there. You know, who knew what was going to happen? Hmm. That's a great reason to write a book. I mean, that's the only reason anyone should ever write a book in a way. Um, I think there's, uh, I, I'm wondering if maybe it would be helpful for you to read page 191, which is sort of the best description I've ever read of, of Bart's distinction between a readerly text and a writerly text. And it's, in a sense, the difference between um, telling a story and making a story. And this is such a made story. Um, it's told, too, but the reader has to be part of it. But I love particularly the top of the page and then the distinction between readerly and writerly text. So maybe you just read as far as you feel like. Okay. Um, thanks. Okay, so in contrast, 
I wanted there to be an illuminated scroll we would all write alongside gender, to have writing forever queer the world. Let writing be the way for us to love without syntagm, friends, the community of our future readers, so we might mate with, as Roland saw it, the bliss of understanding. Because what Roland saw was how all text affects us in its two ways, pleasure, plaisir, or bliss, orgasm, jouissance, which correlate to what he calls readable or writerly text, or writable text. When you encounter the readerly readable text, you find pleasure, yet your position as a subject in the center of your own empire does not shift. Well, what he calls a writable, writerly text offers bliss, a way to explode literary codes and let the reader enter new modes of being, no longer living the false myth of the dominant subject position. So how do you know which text you see? Roland thinks writerly ones matter a bit more, those in which the composition invites you in, those in which you as reader end up connecting with the composition itself, so that our codes stay open, streaming through next to you, yet also placing you in a whole nother burrow. According to him, take on a readerly text, and you stay a staid burger having tea in your house at your usual hour in your usual armchair. Passive, you receive known pleasures and then shut the book. So like, you know, like a, let's say a mystery novel might be that, you know, you kind of enter and you kind of are getting what you want. While well, Roland would say the writerly text asks for a little effort. Maybe you find yourself enacting some of the actions of the writer to understand the dance out of your usual self. Perhaps you become no longer the subject in your armchair. Maybe at least one of the codes in the writerly text asks you to alter the very walls of your codes. And he has these key categories, cultural, hermeneutic, proerotic, semantic, symbolic. All so that you end up in the exact field you might never have get guessed before. So like if you think of uh, poetry often, right? Poetry asks us to kind of change our metaphoric associations, our experience of the world. Your understanding changes a text as it might change you. You have co-written it. And when you return to it, the book will also have been changed by your future self. You will have rewritten understanding so that reading has a possibility of moving beyond pleasure to become bliss. In other words, the writerly text is premised on greater optimism about our capacity to change as people. But who's to say? Hmm. Thank you. I love that passage. It's such a great description. And um, I think the idea that you know you could either read for a story or you could participate in the orgasm of the story. Um, you know, like choice A, <laughs> choice B. And and I think so much of this book is is your wrestling or grappling with what kind of what kind of person to be, more than what kind of writer to be, what kind of person to be. And I think the pressure on you, self-pressure um, in, in, or the narrator anyway, the narrator, but this is also true in your life, I know, that um, the pressure to perform yourself as um, a powerfully cerebral thinker, a person of big ideas, um, uh, someone who's been raised seeing through a male gaze, which all all of us have, um, and kind of kind of refusing some of that. And the initial paragraph here, talking about you know initially feeling that writing can queer the world, and that we were going to be part of this project together. And I feel like you've redeemed that project in this book because it's so much about um, it's so much about a woman writer kind of claiming childhood, motherhood, imperfection, things that aren't often talked about, particularly by Edie Maydev. <laughs> I don't know even what to say to that, but I th that feels so accurate. Yeah, you know, the thing I've been feeling about this book is that the, the nouns resemble my life, but the verbs and the adjectives are quite different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. How how did you um, how did you conceptualize the book? I mean, did it come to you as 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 a, a sound, as a voice, as a narrator? Is there a narrator who you kind of invented or identified with? So, you know, I think Bart and a Lover's Discourse gave me some succor because it, if you look at it, I mean, I hope you can see this book. It's so intimate. And I just, I think what I just wanted to do, I noticed that in a sort of fractured age, our attention span is quite altered. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I find my own attention span is not what it was at the beginning of the pandemic. And so I just really, it was not that I was conceptualizing uh, an ideal reader, but I wanted to really just I wanted it to speak, I wanted any reader to become the ideal reader. I really wanted to lead the reader with me and hold hands with the reader the whole way. And, you know, I've been teaching so long and uh, I have a kind of hubris about knowing when people space out. And so when I would, on the page, I would try to just keep pulling everyone with me. And what's really interesting about this book is that it just feels like, um, you know, there's a Stendhal quote about uh, an angel looks into a novel and, uh, or a devil looks into a novel and it's always, the novel is always a mirror walking mm -hmm. down the road. Mm -hmm. And I just find that people seem to be getting themselves in the book and that just is incredibly gratifying for me. So I feel it's a book about overcoming the burden of narcissism in my own life or in the, narr in the narrator's life. But it's it's kind of gratifyingly like kind of a bunch, like a mosaic of mirrors mm -hmm. somehow, mm -hmm. kind of turned outward. Mm -hmm. That's been my favorite thing about it. That the more personal and intimate you are, mm -hmm. the more it's actually a generous gift to your reader having their own catharsis. Right. It's it's what, what you were referencing before, Bart, talking about the um, the professionalism of the stripper. And I think he, he he contrasts that with um, the the sort of broken garter of the amateur, you know, that that there's something authentic about, you know, there, there's something protective in the garb of the professional. And I think in some ways, um, what this book does is it strips away the authority of the author, the professionalism, the striptease. And you talk a lot about, uh, you know, how, how women are often in drag. We're always in drag. And um, so in a way, it's taking off the drag and trying to um, get back to the natural, which Bart says, or the narrator says is, you know, when are we natural? When are we natural? When we're born? Yeah. Yeah. When we there, eat. Are, there are certain moments mm -hmm. of the real, the, of reality. Yeah. The, the, you know, the visceral, the death moment. So I would love to take this set. Is it okay? Yeah, please? go ahead. Okay. Can you sit next to someone you don't know with your piece of paper? And I would just love to hear you talk. You, you talk privately for five minutes about the four definitions of love that I read. And mm. just speak about your own experience to someone you d didn't know <laughs> before. And then we'll kind of come back into our group and sort of if you wish, you could share any insight you gleaned. We're just going to do that for about five minutes. So, so you're asking people to enter into an immediate, intimate relationship with another person. Accurate. <laughs> <laughs> so the prompt is, see how on the, the there are those, um, yeah, the back of that page, there are those ideas about love. And I just would love you to just kind of reflect on those which of those seem true to your experience? And, you know, and then we'll come back into our group. Okay, I'm just going to read from the middle of the page. Imagine you were chairless. 
People would then care less about you and or reading. And so the act of taking in words would stay yours alone. A private act, rest forehead on school desk, scent lemon wood soap, lay book in lap, bend one knee behind, foot poised, hook ankle behind the other, become an ostrich of reading, hide your face. In this way, no one would ever bother you. Read until you are ready or numb enough to join the world. As in this recurrent dream, the other belief, if I could just take anyone's hand and fly with them. Well, I'm sorry, I'm just getting teary. We could surmount their problems. Okay, carry on. I'm done. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>